this is the seventh or eighth time that I have received the award ceremony. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, each time I've done this, I've been struck by the collection of extraordinarily distinguished scientists in the Washington area. Over the years, our Academy Awards have kept scientists from the University of Maryland, Johns Hopkins, George Mason, GWU, AFIPS, and Georgetown. We recognize scientists who later became Nobelists from NIST and NASA. And I expect that the Nobel Committee would catch up with us in regard to a few other laps. And I'm really honored to be associated with all of these people. One of the truly awarded, rewarding things about this program is that many of our awardees have stayed around and become active in the affairs of the Academy. Uh, both Alan Tawadi and Al Tyke have served as president. This year's awards committee has a host of former awardees, uh, namely Catherine Gebbe, Florence Fazzanelli, Neil Schmidler, Cora Merritt, Jim Higginwriter, who is our president-elect, and Donna Dean, who has also served on our board. James Ellenbogen who led to uh, our very successful um, nanotechnology forum a few years ago. Mike Coble, who seems to have disappeared, uh, <laughs> gave a terrific talk at NSF, which you can see in our entirety on our website. And having said all that, I trust that the current crop of awardees will follow their examples. Uh, after receiving, receiving the award, the awardee and presenter, please go to that little table and pick up the volume of 75 years of scientific thought and an academy pen and go with the versatile Al Tyke to get your picture taken, except that Al Tyke is filling in for Cora Merritt. And since he can't take a picture of himself, if, uh, gee, would you take a picture of that one? Uh, so, the first award for behavioral and social sciences is Dr. Robert Groves, and the presenter is Al Tyke. Directorate, 
which had been closed to, in order to spur technological innovation. He's been a truly impressive leader. I asked Cora for some insights on uh, Bob Groves that I might not find in his CV or in a Google search. She mentioned that he'd been a member of a National Academy panel um, several years ago that produced a report on protecting participants and facilitating social and behavioral sciences research. Cora chaired that panel. She wrote, not only did he bring to bear his deep knowledge about survey research and methods for protecting identities, but he helped refocus our deliberations from ones on the social and behavioral sciences to an overarching emphasis on the subjects of research. I had known Bob before that, uh, but developed through our interactions a lasting respect for his scholarship and his humaneness. Bob Rose has been widely recognized for his contributions, most recently, prior to tonight's award, by election to the National Academy of Sciences. As an aside, I remember it wasn't that long ago that the National Academy began admitting behavioral and social sciences, but not part of the Academy until uh, within uh, the past couple of decades, I guess. Uh, I'm not going to take the time to review all of his honors, publications, and previous positions, but I will only mention that prior to joining the Census Bureau, he was director of the Survey Research Center at the University of Michigan, a renowned, possibly the most renowned center in that field. And among the many positions that he's held that prepared him for life in the Washington bureaucracy, he was a guard at the Vermont State Prison. <laughs> <laughs> I assume uh, when he was an undergraduate, it was a summer job, I assume, when he was an undergraduate at uh, Dartmouth, I don't know if it was a summer job, but I, it was during that same period. Anyway, he's no stranger to the Washington area. He was associate director of the Census Bureau back in the early 1990s. Now, the bad news is that he's leaving the Census Bureau this summer. But the good news is that he's remaining in the Washington area and will become uh, the new provost of Georgetown University in August. <coughs> the certificate that we are presenting to Robert Groves' evening reads, in recognition of excellence in survey methodology from a social and behavioral science perspective and for scientific leadership. I think that just begins to say it. So join me in congratulating Robert Groves.
designed and developed something called the Airfield microscopy for biophysical research. She's referring to optical metrology, high quantum dots for biomedical imaging, and the detection of hazardous biological species such as E. coli bacteria. And he's currently engaged in very measurements of traceability for making optical medical imaging and quantitative science. So optical medical imaging is a complementary technique to some of the CT scans that you were shown earlier this evening. Um, he's applied the development of these techniques to various important problems, uh, such as the detection of malaria and infected red blood cells. And he's partnered on Melinda and Bill Gates' proposal on the development of a diagnostic test from a known. Oh, I can't pronounce it. Pneumonia. <laughs>
And the presenter is Neil Schmidt. So uh, for that, uh, that's why I believe uh, the 
those are two important reasons. Uh, the work that he's done here in Washington, D.C. Uh, in, in his field. So tonight it's, it's an honor and a privilege to recognize Dr. Fernandez as a fellow of the Academy for distinguished career in engineering sciences, in particular for its significant contributions to industrial engineering research, education, professional practice, and national as well as international service to the industrial engineering profession.
as the director of the National Museum of Health and Medicine, which was formerly a subcomponent of the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, located on the Walter Reed campus in Washington, D.C. It's now moved to a new location in Silver Spring, Maryland. Dr. Noe tirelessly pursued efforts to lead, inform, and provide a unique perspective on the advances of medicine and the mutual scientific obligations to pursue the highest purposes of the nation's biomedical assets. And that meant running an operation 364 days a year. And Dr. Noe has been doing that since 1997 as the director. And of note, get your calendars out. On Monday, May 21st, 11 days from now, the National Museum of Health and Medicine will celebrate the 150th anniversary of its founding as the Army Medical Museum in 1862. And it will celebrate it at its new facility on Linden Lane in Silver Spring, Maryland at the Forest Glen Annex. And that's one of the things as I talk about where Dr. Noe was made sure that this is preserved, that this museum has and its facilities will be preserved for the future. Interestingly, this also marks Dr. Noe's 25th year of dedicated and exemplary service to the museum. During her career, Dr. Noe has received multiple professional recognitions, honors, and awards and holds membership and leadership positions in multiple esteemed scientific organizations such as the Academy of Medicine in Washington, D.C., the Aerospace Medical Association, the Medical Museums Association, the Washington Society for the History of Medicine, and she serves as the chair of the Science Advisory Board Krasno Institute for Advanced Studies at George Mason University, and even as a member of the Maryland Humanities Council, Dr. Noe has made it her special interest to bridge this area's geographical, rich science assets with free programming in the humanities. Under her leadership, the National Museum of Health and Medicine has played a key role in nationally significant exhibitions, such as positions on AIDS, women's health, and major shows exploring the relations between medicine and art. There was an interesting exhibit at one point where the combat wound uh, veterans uh, and their arts were discussed and presented, as well as providing medical and forensic science programming for at least a half a million members of our public with a special emphasis on school students. And in fact, some students have come back years later when they received their doctoral degrees and said that because they toured the museum at one stage, that's when they made up their mind they wanted to go into science or become a doctor. Even during the move of the museum in the past year from Washington, D.C. to Silver Spring, Dr. Noe managed to keep programs going for the public by using spaces in downtown Silver Spring to continue to hold public lectures for our children and our adults. And Dr. Noe has ensured that the museum's assets were readily available for scholarly research, and she continually ensured the museum's exhibits were timely. For instance, in 19, uh, from 2007 to 2008, Dr. Noe tirelessly worked to bring to the museum, directly from the battlefield in Iraq, the emergency room tent and related artifacts, including a five-ton piece of concrete that had been the floor of the hospital. And due to her efforts, the museum exhibited the Trauma Bay 2 Bolad Iraq exhibit. And that exhibit moved from Washington, D.C. to Silver Spring and turned out to be one of the trickiest parts of the move for the museum. The National Museum of Health and Medicine has had many homes in its past 150 years, including Ford's Theater in Washington. As I alluded to earlier, the Department of Defense's 2005 Base Realignment and Closure Law Initiative required that the museum, then an element of the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, move from its home at Walter Reed. And that had to be done by September of 2011. However, during the period of 2005 to 2007, the new home 
for the museum was uncertain. And for a period of time, there was even discussion of warehousing the museum or having a trifling exhibit. However, Dr. Noe and her dedication to the preservation of science and medicine pressed forward to ensure a proper facility was built to ensure the integrity of the museum as a force in the preservation, presentation, interpretation, collecting, and research of materials related to the sciences. And as a result of her critical foresight, Dr. Noe led the museum to build an intricate design and construction of a purpose-built facility on the grounds at Forest Glen. And the museum uh, moved 24 million pieces. Therefore, it is my honor this evening to present for the second time of the Academy, the Washington Academy of Sciences Award for the History of Science to Dr. Adrian Noe.
I should note that uh, the museum uh, escaped uh, from the Ford Theater in uh, 1898, uh, just one year before the Academy arrived there. <laughs> uh, the Bernice Lamberton Award for Elementary and Secondary Teaching goes to Myra Lynn Hoops Thayer. And the presenter is Jim Higginreiter. I'm pleased to recognize Myra Thayer with the Lamberton Award for Science Education. In her leadership in Fairfax County Public Schools and Virginia Science Education leadership, she has advanced and created many new opportunities, strategies, and resources for students and teachers of science. Myra has been a science or math teacher, and early on, even a music teacher, for over 30 years, beginning in Michigan, then New York, New Jersey, I may have that re but she can clarify, uh, in California. Her involvement in science education in Fairfax County began in 1989 as a chemistry teacher and department chair, and in 1998 she became the high school science and education specialist. Since 2005, she has served as the pre-K through 12 science coordinator for Fairfax County Public Schools, overseeing 500 science teachers and specialists. In this role, she's advanced many innovations in supplying classrooms with necessary equipment, grading policies for all subjects in the school system, coordination with special education and limited English proficiency programs, She's managed new environmental stewardship programs and coordinated science fairs involving over 600 students and 500 judges every year. Myra has also led partnerships with nonprofit organizations, government agencies, and local businesses, the Virginia Department of Education, and she's been active in state science education organization leadership. Specifically, she's the founding member and vice president of the Virginia State Science and Engineering Fair and chair of the Policy Committee for the Virginia Science Education Leadership Association. She's also served as adjunct faculty at Old Dominion University at Fort Belvoir and at George Mason University in Fairfax. And Myra told me of two formative influences in her career path that I wanted to share with you. The first was the encouragement of others at the time she entered college to promote women in careers other than teaching. So she explored chemistry. And then during college, uh, she was surprised and disappointed to learn that so many others disliked their high school science experience. And she found the determination to do something about that. Uh, Myra received a BA in chemistry and math from Hope College, a master's in teaching with a specialization in chemistry from Stanford University. And she's currently completing a doctorate in education leadership and policy at Virginia Tech. Like most educators we've considered for our education awards, she's accomplished much, but clearly there is more to come. I believe uh, Bernice Lamberton will be very proud. We're proud to recognize her in the Washington Academy of Sciences. Myra? Not be amazed. 
and had great wonder. So I was blessed for 20 years with the very best job in the world, and that was helping youngsters get excited about science. For the last 10 years, I've had the second best job in the world, which is to impact the teaching and learning, the teaching of the, with the teachers and the learning of 185,000 students in Fairfax County to get them excited about teaching, about learning science and the teachers about teaching science to all of these students. There's a lot of talk right now about the importance of STEM education in science education. And I can tell you personally that this is happening at high policy levels and in the newspaper. And it is not touching K-6 at all. In K-6, we are working really hard to leave no child behind in language arts and in mathematics. And in that process, we are leaving lots of children behind in science. And if we want this room to be filled with people of great diversity and knowledge of science 50 years from now, we have to do something about that right now to excite those young children to engage in science. So our job, our job <coughs> is to change that reality that's happening right now. So help us, us together, we have to help each other help our children, because I saw future scientists and engineers in those laughing children that you showed in the picture. And we have to make that a reality. Thank you. Methodology 
IG scientist. Uh, since arriving, he has set up a new directorate and has worked to strengthen the research and methodology work at the Census Bureau and to promote its use. Uh, Ron has over 170 refereed publications and is classified as a highly cited researcher by the Institute for Scientific Information. Uh, his publications are notably in the analysis of data with missing values and model-based survey inference. Uh, and applications of statistics to diverse scientific areas including medicine, demography, economics, psychiatry, aging, the environment, and transportation safety. His medical application papers include work on Alzheimer's uh, and other forms of dementia, breast cancer, coronary artery disease, and today just a few. Rod has written or edited five books. His book with Don Rubin, Statistical Analysis with Missing Data, <coughs> is a modern day classic. It has well over 11,000 Google Scholar citations and has had enormous influence in the profession and in applications. Uh, Rod has done extensive editorial work. Uh, let me only mention that he was the coordinating applications editor of the Journal of the American Statistical Association, the <coughs> top journal in the field of statistics. Rod is a fellow of the American Statistical Association and the Royal Statistical Society. He's an elected member of the International uh, Statistical Institute. He is a 2010 elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I put this in perspective, Hillary Rodham Clinton and Clint Eastwood did not make it in until this year. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, he's an elected member of the Institute of Medicine, which is the medical component of the National Academies. So I'm proud to present the award to Rodham. Statistics is the, the new sexy career. <laughs> so I'm really delighted that there are two statisticians who have actually been uh, um, given awards at this, by this distinguished society, but both myself and, and Director Bob over there, Bob Rose. Um, director and jailer, Bob, I should say. Uh, I'm very happy that you gave him an award as well, because that means he might unlock my door so I, I can actually get out of my office at the Census Bureau. So. Uh, actually, I'm just kidding. Um, we, we've had a great time together working on developing a new um, director at, 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 the, um, at the Census Bureau. Um, you know, um, I, I told a history professor that uh, Bob was at, at Georgetown, that uh, Bob was going to be the, uh, the next privilege at Georgetown. He said, I hope we're not going to get another bean counter. So I, I want to dispel the idea that statisticians are actually just bean counters. Um, uh, in, in a sense, uh, statisticians of the Bureau sort of play the role of, uh, we see CAT scans of mummies. So I, I, I see the Bureau as being, creating CAT scans of, of US society, actually giving the information that allows citizens to do, to make good decisions and, and politicians to make good decisions as well. It's, uh, it's not been counting actually creating these censuses and surveys, it actually involves a lot of work and it involves a lot of science. So um, it's really great that, uh, that that's being recognized here. And, and I can tell you that uh, Bob is just an unbelievable director. What he's done at the Bureau in the last couple of years just uh, will, 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 can't, can't be matched. So um, uh, thank you very much, and uh, it's been really a great honor.
he got his training at the Courant uh, Institute. And for those of you uh, who have a mathematics background, Courant is sort of the center of the universe uh, for uh, certain areas of applied mathematics, such as uh, fluid dynamics. Uh, so he got a very thorough grounding uh, in fluid dynamics, which has applications ranging from uh, the behavior of supernova explosions to uh, aircraft in flight uh, to the distribution of fluids through something as, as trivial as pampers. Uh, so uh, it's a very, very important application. <laughs> I, I was thinking a little bit about what to say about, about Jeff's career, and I think rather than try to give an overview of such a, such a broad-ranging career, I wanted to make just a couple of observations. One is, I think, I think some of the most important uh, science that's done, and certainly this is true in mathematics, uh, falls into one of sort of two categories. The, the first category is a scientific result which when you see it, you think, well, of course, that's, that's such an obvious result, I can't believe I didn't think of that. And you, you're filled with jealousy that you, <laughs> that you didn't actually get to, to make that uh, seminal discovery. Uh, and the other one, paradoxically, is almost exactly the reverse, which is uh, you, you see a scientific result and you, and you read it through over and over again, and you finally convince yourself that it's true, and yet emotionally you still know this, this isn't possible. No one can have actually solved this problem. It's too hard. And so it turns out, uh, I'm pleased to say, uh, that I supervise a laboratory in which we have a mathematician like Jeff who has actually done uh, work in both camps. Uh, he's, he's actually been an extraordinary uh, and very, very prolific mathematician. Uh, mathematicians uh, have a certain average publishing rate. Uh, I, I, I will not tell you what mine is. It would be far too embarrassing. Uh, I left mathematical research some years ago. Um, but uh, I, it's suffice to say that uh, uh, Jeff's uh, output is sort of an order of magnitude uh, more prolific uh, than, than even the average uh, decent mathematician. And so, that should give you an understanding of just how, what, how prolific he is. Um, the, the fluid dynamics area that he's uh, made pioneering contributions to uh, is to the theory of phase transitions, uh, which is a key to understanding uh, the behavior of many materials ranging from, from uh, ice, uh, formation of ice, to, uh, to metal alloys. Uh, among the uh, primary areas he's worked in is phase field models for solidification. Uh, a technique that enables mathematical modeling of crystals with extremely complex geometries, such as dendrites uh, common in ice crystals. Uh, and that has revolutionized the field, largely due to some of the seminal work that Jeff, uh, uh, that, that Jeff uh, pioneered. Uh, he's received awards too numerous for me to mention here, but I'll give you a few of the highlights. Uh, the Department of Commerce awarded him the gold medal, the highest award that the department is, is able to, uh, to bestow uh, for, for scientific and technical work. Uh, the Arthur Fleming Award for Exemplary Federal Service. He's been named as a fellow of the American Physical Society. Uh, he's a fellow uh, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, and recently was also provided uh, one of the first uh, uh, fellow designations for the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. It's a privilege for me to, uh, to lead a laboratory that has the kind of scientist that, uh, that Jeff is and the work that he represents on behalf of NIST. And it's a great, great pleasure and an honor for me to introduce you to him this evening.
And in particular, I'd like to thank my friends who are here sharing this table one. <laughs> and tonight, Chuck and Mary Romain, Ron and Rita Bobert, and Carl and Marianna Williams. And again, my wife, Roberta Page McFadden. So thank you all very much. James Althoff. The presenter is Catherine Gebbe. Good evening. It's my privilege and very real pleasure to introduce Jim Althoff to you, Dr. James Althoff to you and the Washington Academy of Sciences this evening. Jim's contributions to NIST's mission in ecology span the whole range from those as a bench scientist when he advanced the frontiers of plasma physics to those as a manager of NIST's measurement services program, the most robust, rigorous, and diverse such program in the world. Jim is one of the few scientists anywhere about whom I have never heard anything but positive comments. You mention Jim Althoff to anyone who knows him, and their eyes light up, inevitably. And this is not because he treats management as a uh, popularity contest, but because people all respect and trust his judgment, even when he has to make the hard decisions, which he does often with no hesitation at all. I consider that the utmost respect. Jim came to NIST in 1987, and his career here has been characterized by um, a history of achievements, including the first ever measurement of toxic byproducts of high power voltage systems. His technique was 1,000 times better than any previous approach and was the only technique capable of detecting, this to detecting the toxins at a part, 10 parts uh, per billion level required by OSHA. Under his leadership, NIST has produced some of its most notable achievements. The determinant of the world's determination of the world's best value of Planck's constant, the development and fabrication of the world's most complex arrays of superconducting circuits, which are now deployed on the scuba submillimeter telescope in Hawaii, the production and deployment of the first quantum AC voltage standard, and motivated by the Watergate tapes, <laughs> he, his people have delivered to the FBI a device to analyze previously erased magnetic recordings. <laughs> and, um, and he's also contributed to world-leading results in, uh, so I'll say, quantum computing. In his current position, he is responsible for the core mission of NIST serving uh, industry through a broad portfolio of measurement services. He's responsible, ultimately, for 25,000 tests per year on 2,800 items for over 600 different customers, twice as many services as any other metrology institute in the world. Every year, the accuracy of nearly 40 million mammograms and 40,000 radiation treatment plans for prostate cancer rely on measurements made by NIST. Every day, NIST has over 11 billion hits on its network time servers. And Dr. Althoff is ultimately responsible for all of these services. His broad contributions to the physical scientists from his independent research to his management of the research and services of others 
makes him well deserving of a recognition from the Washington Academy of Sciences. Thank you. Space Shuttle Atlantis 
flew the last uh, mission uh, three years ago tomorrow, May 11th, to uh, repair and replace parts. Uh, we watched this uh, real time, uh, live on TV, on NASA TV, as the astronauts on that mission had to break off a handle, torque a bolt beyond its, natural, its specification, and do many other complex and risky things to keep that telescope working. And the, the mission was completely successful, which gave the Hubble a full complement of five functioning state-of-the-art instruments, uh, telescopes, cameras, spectrographs, and so forth, over a very wide spectral range uh, for future observations. So it's now still running. It's alive and well. Incidentally, I believe that these servicing missions represent the best example of how both humans and machines can work together in space exploration. So over 2,500 scientific papers were based on the Hubble data in its first 10 years of life. That was 12 years ago. Uh, many more since then. The Hubble Space Telescope has received uh, has uh, been the, the source of many astronomical discoveries, such as the recent discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe, for which uh, uh, the uh, Nobel, Nobel Prize was given last year to Adam Rees and his colleagues uh, at the Space Telescope Science Institute. So it, uh, the, the Hubble keeps producing about 120 gigabytes of new data every week, and we can expect this telescope to continue to generate new discoveries for many years. Uh, now, uh, David is coasting into a relatively stress-free retirement, and I am honored to present Dr. David Crone with his well-deserved award for service to science. Thank you, David, very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul, for those kind comments, and I I want to give my heartfelt thanks to the Washington Academy of Sciences for this uh, recognition. It's a high honor to be, and I feel very privileged to, to receive it. Um, before the orchestra plays, and I have to stop talking, there's a, there's a little sermon that I have to give. Um, I have worked on Hubble for 33 years. Uh, the, past, the last 17 years of that is the senior project scientist at the Space Spatial Life Center. And over that several decades of uh, my career, it was my great privilege and, and honor to work with literally thousands of people on the Hubble program. And of course, this included many scientists, uh, my scientific colleagues at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. Uh, we had 12, count 12 different scientific instruments developed by Hubble, and each of those instruments had associated with it, a team of scientists that, that I'd love to, to work with and get to know as friends. Um, we have uh, colleagues at NASA headquarters and colleagues at Goddard and other computer scientists, of course. And a number of the astronauts, 32 astronauts, uh, service total over uh, those five servicing missions, several of them more than once, and they risked their lives for them. So it's been a great privilege and honor to work with all of these teams. And I'd like to point out that in addition to those people who you might naturally expect to be other people, there was a very large unsung group of engineers, managers, administrative specialists, secretaries, who work behind the scenes day in and day out to keep Hubble operating 24-7, 365 in a manner that seems a lot, that looks a lot simpler than it really is, and to tackle head on the technical challenges of actually doing servicing in a large structure like Hubble with intricate tools and intricate, intricate instrumentation in the urban environment. And these people don't get any recognition, so I want to be sure to, to acknowledge that I'm here receiving this award on that behalf. Thank you very much. Kit Peek 
biggest collection of telescopes that astronomers use. And when we observe all night, we often take a, a break at midnight for night lunch. Mm -hmm. I was a young Nalami research assistant, and I had no idea that the lady munching sandwiches with me <coughs> was redefining astronomy. So let's see, she earned her BA at Vassar, her MA at Cornell, her PhD at Georgetown, all in astronomy. She stayed at Georgetown for a while, and then she moved to the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism at the Carnegie Institute here in DC. She is holder of at least 11 honorary degrees, not to mention in 1993 receiving the US National Medal of Science. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and many other professional sciences societies and too many publications and invited lectures and conferences for me to list. I lost him. In the meantime, she developed new fields of astronomy. This started with her doctoral dissertation where she showed that the distribution of galaxies in the universe was not smooth, but lumpy. Initially criticized, she was, of course, eventually vindicated. Later, she and her collaborators were among the first to investigate if there were large-scale motions of galaxies superimposed on the general expansion of the universe. Several large astronomical consortia are now making extensive observations to address this question formed for us by Vera. Having set up one new field of research, she moved on to another. Dark matter is so much a part of today's astronomy that we can easily forget how groundbreaking it was to propose. It was in 1933 that work with galaxy clusters identified the question of mass missing in the universe. Mass we do not see, but gravity tells us is there. It was a question left hanging and mostly ignored for some 40 years. The astronomical community's overwhelming expectation was that spiral galaxies, these are ones that look like fried eggs, um, would exhibit a capillarian behavior. The rotation speed of the star would fall off with distance from the center the same way the planets do. The Earth revolves faster than Jupiter does about the sun. No one bothered to study this because, of course, we knew the answer. It was all changed in the 1970s when Vera began her work on spiral galaxies. She and her colleagues observed hundreds of spiral galaxies showing that something other than visible mass was responsible for the motions of stars. As a result of her groundbreaking work, it is now accepted that more than 90% of the material universe is composed of something non-luminous, i.e. dark. Our starlit skies are dark. This shook the foundations of astronomy. It is given to few of us to change a paradigm. To this day, we do not have a convincing explanation of what she found. Defining this missing piece of the universe is currently one of astronomy's most important pursuits. Perhaps this missing piece is dark matter, or perhaps on large scales, Newtonian gravity needs to be modified. We do not know. Vera leaves us with a question to ponder. Moving on, her work with other galaxies confirmed the importance of galactic cannibalism. <laughs> yes, galaxies can subsume each other. And the importance of mergers in driving galaxy evolution. This is now considered a given in modern astronomy. Vera had to find another entire field of astronomical research. We enter 21st century astronomy, assuming that dark matter exists. We still strive to explain large-scale motions of the universe, from galaxy disks to halos surrounding galaxies to galaxy clusters. The work of Vera Rubin has changed the face of astronomy and made astronomical history. Please join me in welcoming Vera Rubin.
be Frank Tang, and I have the privilege of um, serving on the audit committee for the Washington Academy of Sciences. And so we'll give our very short report. Um, so we audited the books uh, this past March and found them at sound order. And we thank Larry Millstein for his work, his treasure for the Academy. And our letter to such effect is in the official file of the Academy. Right? Anything else to add? No, that's our report. <laughs> so as we wrap up here, I'd just like to say that the state of the academy is very sound. In the past year, we've executed a very vibrant program, including our affiliates reception, science is murder, and our best ever capital science conference, which is held here at the University Row.